Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce our very first speaker that's kicking off Dry in the Desert. Does anybody in here not know who Dr. Blumenstein is? <laughs> so Dr. Blumenstein, he lectured for our hybrid event in Las Vegas last year, and people loved him so much, they keep requesting him to come back. So all the online people, you're welcome. He's back. Dr. Blumenstein is a 1990 graduate of the University of California, Los Angeles with a degree in biology. He received his optometric degree from the New England College of, of Optometry. And then after graduation, Dr. Blumenstein finished a residency in secondary ophthalmic care at Burnett Delaney Eye Center in Phoenix. Then he received his fellowship from the American Academy of Optometry in December 1998. Currently, Dr. Blumenstein is the Director of Optometric Services at Schwartz Laser Eye Center in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he is on the editorial board of Primary Care Optometry, Review of Optometry, Optometry Times, Modern Optometry, Optometric Management, and a million other optometric journals. Dr. Blumenstein is uh, one of my favorite speakers, so it's so exciting to have him kick off our event. Thank you, Dr. Blumenstein. After the nice introduction, I, I feel kind of almost compelled um, to, to try to be better. I'm going to try to like, you know, go all Melania. And I'm going to be best if I possibly can here. We'll see how that works. This, there is no expert insight into dry eye. This was the title of the lecture. And I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I have never, ever subscribed to the notion that there is a dry eye expert. I've subscribed to the notion is this, is that every single one of us has to hone our own expertise into how we can manage this scourge of our patient's ability to kind of function. You know, years ago, I wrote an article. Um, it was me, Kelly Nichols. And I'm trying to remember who the other person was. And this was literally 12 years ago. And in the article, it was like managing dry eye from three different practice perspectives. And one was like a, you know, Kelly, you know, being at the University of Alabama, it was like a research at the time, uh, me and a cataract and refractive surgery center. And I can't remember who the other person was and I felt terrible um, who worked in a private practice. And literally I, my first sentence in there was, I don't have a dry eye practice. I'm an optometrist that treats dry eye. And I want anybody and everybody who's listening or to walk away from this and just think, you know what, you basically have the ability to decide what this means to you in your practice, but you have to do something. And to me, for those of us that basically say, oh, you know what, I'm going to refer you to a, to a clinic, that's great because they may have all the equipment you don't have, and that's important. Or you may say, you know what, this isn't my problem, it's somebody else's problem, then I'm going to tell you, no, you're wrong. Because as our profession keeps evolving and changing, the one thing that's not going to change is that our patients need us on the front lines. They need us there as their advocate to help them manage this disease state. This is me. Here's all my disclosures. Yeah, I have no financial interest in anything except one thing, and that's Starbucks. Okay, and I'll be really honest with you. I'm jonesing right now because I brought a Starbucks in here, and then... Um, one of the Abbey V Allergan reps is like, hey, let me hook you up with some coffee. And I'm like, okay. And I put my Starbucks cup down and I think they threw it away. So I'm, I'm dead inside a little bit right now. Um, but just, I just wanted everybody to know that. Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. The coffee here at the Henry's okay, but it's no Pike Place. It's no Pike Place. When we think about the prevalence, and I mentioned this earlier, if you were paying attention, when we talk about this, this Kala disease and Kala has a, you know, Isuvis, we start talking about this estimated 16 million patients that are diagnosed. What does that mean? Okay, what does a diagnosis mean? Does that mean when a patient comes in, you sit there and say, you have dry eye? Because, I mean, I'm going to get into this in a little bit in a few seconds here. But to me, the effort for you to tell a patient that they have a disease, that's a lot. I mean, when a patient walks in and says, yo, boo, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So why are you here? You know, I just thought it was time. You know, I just want to, you know, maybe update my prescription. And so yeah, that's why I'm here. It's like they come in with no problems and now we have to give them a problem. Okay. There's, there's lots of space up here. Okay. They, they come in, they have no problem. Now you have to give them a problem. 
And yet, how many of you guys look at people's eyes, look at their lids, look at their quality of tears, and you say, you know what? You look like Miss Jackson, okay? You're nasty, okay? You're nasty, and I know it, but they don't know it. And yet, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to say, oh, you know what? By the way, right? It's almost like literally like with Upneek, okay? And, and, and I'm bringing this up just from the perspective of, I find it hard to walk into a lane and say, oh, I thought you were sleeping. Excuse me? Well, your lids are so low. Are you interested in a drop that will raise your lids? And it's like, I don't think my lids are low. I don't either. I was just kidding. Never mind. <laughs> I, I mean, you, 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 you really, we want patients to walk in and say, yo, is there a drop that I could use to raise my lids? I'm glad you asked because now I can offer that to you. We want patients to walk in and say, um, I've got dry eyes. And for us as optometrists, when somebody says, I have something, then we say, oh, we can maybe do something to fix it. You know, and better yet, stop using this to suck and we can do something different. So to me, I think this 16 million is ridiculous because I think we see this disease all the time, but we're just not diagnosing it. We're not giving our patients to diagnose it. When we start looking at it underdiagnosed, 100%. More importantly, this is a disease state that we used to think is that when we were in school, we were taught, this is your middle-aged, you know, what is middle-aged anymore? 50, okay, right? 40 to 50-year-old patient. It's tr traditionally, it's a female because it's hormonally based, right? Maybe also because they're the ones that actually, you know, care about themselves. I mean, when I, I mean, look it up neat, right? If I say it to a dude, he's like, dude, I don't even look in the mirror unless I have to shave. And then it's usually all foggy. And it's like, I can tell, I mean, I, I can tell you didn't look in the mirror today, okay? Is that these patients, we used to think middle-aged females, right? Look at their medications, they're on certain medications and we basically would hone in on that. You know, I used to tease that I live in Arizona and you know what? Profiling was legalized by our governor a few years ago, but we can profile our patients. Mm -hmm. To me, we profile our dry eye patients. And that profile has to change. This is a disease that's making our patients younger and younger and younger. And if you don't believe me, just look at your young patients that are coming into your practice and see what they're doing every single second they're in your lane. They're on their phone, okay? They're, they're strolling, skimming. I have three 20 year old kids. Okay, and I, I love, I like said to one of my sons once, I'm like, hey, I go, you got to watch this show. It's on CBS. He goes, what's CBS? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, dad, is it on Hulu? And I'm like, no. He goes, Amazon Prime, Netflix. And I go, Max, do you watch all these? Uh, yeah. I'm like, aren't you in school? He goes, yeah, but that's only like a couple hours a day. <laughs> They're on monitors and computers and cell phones 24 seven. And it's not your 40 to 50 year old patients. So our notion of this, this, change here, we have to correlate it back to what our patients are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, for those of you that were listening, you know, when I, I was up here earlier, I talked about this WIFT. I talked about what's in it for them. And I always think about what's in it for me is that we became eye doctors because we wanted to help our patients. You know, maybe some of us, you know, that's they, they did it for the chicks and the money. And I see you. I see you. Okay. That's awesome. Right. Some of us basically don't care about our patients. And that's cool too. But you know what? If you care about the, the money, then you know what? You need your patients to be doing well and being happy. But from that altruistic standpoint, what's in it for them is that you're providing them an opportunity to keep doing the things that are important to them. Okay. Like working right? Or, or, or being on screen time. And so I always find a little nugget of what my patient is important or what's important to them. One of the things I always ask patients when they come in is I'm like, what are you streaming right now? Give me a show. Anybody? Give me a show. All right. And they're like, oh, severance on Apple TV. And I'm like, a little dark. Okay. I see you. All right. I've watched three episodes of it. Very dark. And if anybody, is anybody here watching severance? Yeah, pretty, pretty crazy, okay? We can bring it down a little bit and watch a little bit of Suicide Squad or maybe even Peacemaker. Peacemaker, anybody? What, do you guys not watch TV? Pull out your phones right now. Get your earphones in and start listening. This is going to be a long day of CE, okay? You can probably rip through like four or five episodes of Peacemaker, okay? Try it. Because when you're on the screen time, one of the things that we need is we need the homeostasis. We need a, a tear film 
that basically is kind of intact and has all the proteins and the nutrients we need. Okay. A normal healthy tear film is comprised of the mucin and it's comprised of those proteins, the aqueous layer, and then the goblet cells, which kind of like hold it all down there. Okay. And then pulling in and, and protecting it. You have the mybum, the mucin and the aqueous. But what happens when our patients are basically on kind of like monitors or go outside or breathing, you know, all the things that are important to us, we change that homeostasis and we induce an inflammatory cycle. And if you've never seen this inflammatory cycle, it's kind of small up here, but the truth of the matter is, is that you see my bony and gland dysfunction up there. You see this kind of revolution here of instability and hyperosmolarity. Hyperosmolarity, taking the, you know, too much salt, not enough fluid, inducing inflammatory mediators, which in turn basically does what? Causes aptosis, causes dryness, but you know what? All of that is on a, on a micro level. And to me, that I'll leave that for the experts. I'll leave that for the people that read the do's and the do-do. And if you don't know what the do-do is, that was the do's too that they did in Paris. So it's do-do. I will leave you guys to read those because when you get into the, the, the minutia of all the different molecules, it's not gonna impress your patients when you come in and say, oh, by the way, your IL-6 and you know, some of these other protein mediators are just not really, they're gonna be like, okay, okay. And you're gonna be like, all right, so what do we do? And then bring it back. To me, bring it to the basics. The basics are, this is an inflammatory disease state. And all of us as eye doctors know that if we don't control the inflammation, if we don't do something to change that inflammatory state, then we're not gonna be able to help our patients. This is not always easy to identify. And if it was, I'll be honest with you, you know what, then we would not be talking about this for the last, I don't know, forever. Think about the first immunomodul immunomodulating um, molecule that came out, okay? That was 22 years ago, 22 years ago, Allergan came out with Restasis. Right. And then we saw Lafitagrass, we got Zydra, we've seen Sequa, we've had chronic dry eye medications. And yet I guarantee you that there is not a drug rep out there who isn't banging their head against the wall, trying to understand if we see so many of these patients, why are so few doctors prescribing medications to help them? And part of the reason why is because it's a confounding disease state. And part of it is because we want our patients to walk in and say, hey, I've got this problem. When we start looking at it, it's hidden because why? Because even if they've had it for so long, it could be muted. I mean, patients don't feel, I mean, it's again, I'm going to go back to my, my married people in the room here, right? You just, you just become dead to certain emotions, right? You just realize this is your, your fate and lot. Is there anybody here that's engaged? Because it's, I'm, you go, man, you go, it's going to be great. But in 20 years, <laughs> in 20 years, you're just going to be sitting there going, yes. And then your phone's going to go off and go, I have to go. My wife needs something. God, I feel you. Okay, just remember, can I give you some advice? She's always right, okay? And even when she's not, she'll convince you she is, so she's right, okay? When we start seeing these symptoms, they overlap with ocular surface diseases. You know, I don't know how many times I've heard patients say, well, you know what, it's, it's not a contact lens dry eye. It's, it's a contact lens intolerance or something. There has been this huge debate. I felt like I was outside uh, at the exhibit hall. And for those of you who aren't live, I'm sorry, but we had like a little exhibit hall here and the two different reps from the companies were walking in on each other. And I felt like I was an anchor man where they were just going to throw down, right? And literally go at each other. To me, I feel like contact lens doctors and then just regular doctors, we like meet somewhere in the middle where it's like, you're dumb, okay? It's the fit, it's the solution. You don't know what you're doing. And I see some contact lens people staring me down right now and I'm scared, okay? <laughs> you put your sclerals away right now, okay? And then as dry eye people are all like, you know what? I think you need to work on the tears. It's not the tears, it's the contacts. You're stupid. I'm like, you're stupid. And then I'm like, you before out the door, boom. That's an old contact lens reference, by the way, okay? Seba Visi tints, no? Remember Seba Visi tints and the little vials? Okay, right? More importantly, numerous diagnostics exist. No single method is preferred, but most of us, we still revert back to 
let's try one thing at a time or hey you're on these tiers oh yeah no you need to change those tiers to these tiers and let's be a hundred percent sincere when your patient walks out the door they walk into a walmart they see the drop that you told them to get which is like 26 bucks and then they see one next to it that Walmart makes for a dollar, what do you think they're gonna do? It's just as good. They're not using this over-the-counter drop that you suggested they do. When I think about low-hanging fruit, when I think about how we all can get our patients to kind of manage this disease state, I go back to my bony and gland dysfunction. And to me, I go back to what can I physically show a patient? What can I tangibly basically get them to wrap their arms around? And you know what, if you have a camera and you take a picture of an inspissated meibomian gland, or better yet, if you push on that gland and you just squeeze out all kinds of horrific disgustingness on their eye, and then you basically just tell them, look, I just vomited in my mouth a little bit. You know what? That is impactful because patients will sit there and say, so what do I need to do? We know meibomian gland disease is currently thought to be the leading cause of this disease state. And more importantly, when we start thinking about this, Corb and Blackie basically showed us that the meibomian gland are these large sebaceous glands on our lids. These are hair follicles, basically. And more importantly, they're secreting meibum. And what is meibum supposed to do? It acts like that, that barrier on the outside of the watery portion. It's literally the lid on your Tupperware, right? The lid that you can never find, right? What, what the, it's like socks in the dryer. The lid to the Tupperware that's not there. So then you use saran wrap and the saran wrap doesn't fit, and then everything in there is dried out, and it's useless, and you throw it away. To me, having a good, healthy meibomian gland basically means you have good quality of tears. But how do these glands work? These glands work because when you blink, the ocularis muscles basically induce about 3.0 PSI, which causes a little secretion of this, this meibom. Well, what is the one thing that we know every single one of our patients is not doing these days? It's blinking. I remember about 15 years ago, I started working with a colleague of mine who used to have a private, her own private practice. And she leaned over me once and she said, well, it's kind of the 2020-20 rule. And I'm like, the 2020-20 rule? I had no idea what that was. Okay? I mean, and she's like, Mark, every 20 minutes, you look 20 feet away for about 20 seconds. And I'm like, I had never heard that. And she goes, are you even an optometrist? And I'm like, are, are you? <laughs> I mean, I, I literally now, this is, I probably say that more than I say anything else when I walk into a lane. Look away from what you're doing. Spend a few seconds, find some hottie, look out the window. Oh, you work at home? There are no hotties? He's married too. Okay, so look out the room, right? Just find something that, blink a few times. If you go and look at like, you know, the myopia control studies they have, they compare it against, you know, kids, how much time they need to be outside versus on a monitor and such. It's ridiculous. It's not 2020, 20, it's like two hours or something. It's insane, but they're not doing it. When I look at my bomian glands, I just think these guys get obstructed. So the digital aspect of it is clogged. We're not getting the mybum. We're squeezing and nothing's happening, but better yet, we blink one third of the amount of time. And I tell my patients that. I live there, I say, you know what, are you on a phone, a tablet? I asked them what they were screening because I want to know that they're on it and I want them to know that I know, that they know. And so now that we both know, I can sit there and say, don't say you don't do it because I know you do it. Girl, don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, you did it. Okay, right? right? Now, with that being said, is that we have to give them then solutions. We have to tell them what the problem is. We have to say, I see you, I feel you. My bony and gland dysfunction is an inflammatory disease. And for those of us that are sitting here and saying to our patient, how can I get my patient to understand the quality of their tears, that this disease state is important, is to me is I feel you got to upend it a little bit. And when I say, you know, being an expert, it's like knowing how to talk to your patients about getting them to want to change the things they're doing. When you think of the word dry, and I, I will say this until the day I die. And truthfully, it may be tomorrow. I don't know. If you guys all tell my wife what I've been saying, it might be this afternoon, okay? More importantly, Webster's Dictionary describes the word dry as free or relatively free from a liquid and especially water, okay? Not being in or under water. 
lacking precipitation or humidity. Okay, not moist. Does anybody hate the word moist? You do. Okay, good. Because you know what? I hate the word dry. So to me, how do you go to a patient and say to them, your eyes are watery, they're dry? It's, it's like, it makes no sense. How do you go to a patient who has no symptoms and no problems and say, you have dry eyes? I have never, ever, ever understood how we can sit there and call this dry when the reality is that it's not, it's inflamed. And I always think of like recurrent erosions. Remember in recurrent erosions, how we, this, this mindset is that our lid sticks to our cornea and when we wake up, we pull it off because it's so dry. No, my mindset is that it's like a bloated animal on the side of the road. And you go in to like pick up, you know, boo-boo kitty because you feel bad, but it's been out there for a few hours. And now your hand is like inside boo-boo kitty. You feel me? It's like necrotic and soft. It's like a wet newspaper. To me, the word dry is a conundrum to your patients. And so if we're going to be able to have these insights with our patients, we need to get them to like understand what we're talking about. What I kind of feel what we need to do is we need to keep it simple. Okay like my boys here, right? These guys were like, look, we're rock musicians, right? We want people to take us seriously. So we're gonna dress our faces up and stick our tongues out and we're gonna keep it simple, stupid. To me, we need to basically walk into our lanes and say, how can I make this as understandable and as easy as possible? I do not subscribe to a lot of the different protocols and all of these different kind of nomograms we have. If you do A, then go to B, B subset D, try this. And I have, I do have a simple way that I kind of go in there and I adopted this from Chris Starr, who's an ophthalmologist and Priya Gupta, who's another ophthalmologist. Okay. And they basically came up with LLPP. Okay. Is it LLPP? LLPP. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Yeah, it is, okay? And if you don't know, this is the name, okay? That I'm gonna give this. And if you notice over here, you see, who's that, okay? That's TDK. And for those of you that don't think TDK is a name, yes, it is, because we all have letters in our name, so that's a name too. And for those of you who haven't watched Suicide Squad, here's another reason to watch Suicide Squad, because this was a character from Suicide Squad. It's pretty quiet at home too, I'm sure, okay? But for those of you who watch this, Scott, Scott, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Okay, all right. To me, LLPP is when I walk into an exam lane, I want to basically look at my patient. And I, I told you that this is basically this, I can't remember specific protocol. I think this is from Ascaris. And they literally said, how can we make this easy for doctors to understand that it's not just asking a patient, do you have dry eye? Because if you ask, they'll say no. And the ones that say yes, those are the ones that are going to basically bring you down. The ones that say, oh yeah, my eyes are really dry. Those are the ones that you're gonna like wish were not on your schedule anymore. And if you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I've been to like nine doctors and none of them can help me. So uh, yeah, I tried that. No, I did that. No, I'm not gonna do that. It's like, okay, right? And then what you do, if you work in a multi-doctor practice, you ship them to another doctor in the practice. Boom, that just happened. I'm gonna have you see so-and-so over here because they are an expert in your problem, which is what? Which is all of it, okay, it's all of it. To me, LLPP, okay, Priya Gupta and Chris Starr. But I, will, I do also wanna share something about Priya. A Priya did a study um, years ago when she was at Duke University and she looked at the uh, meibomian glands and she looked at atrophy of the meibomian glands. And what she found is, I think it was about 194 consecutive patients. She looked at these patients and she found what? She found atrophy of the meibomian glands in about 40% of her patients. Now, for those of you that don't have a mybographer, that's kind of high, but I'll be honest with you, I see it even higher. And mainly the reason why is because Priya at the time was working in a pediatric ophthalmology practice. Her patient's ages were range four to 14. Think about that for a second. Your four to 14 year old is inducing atrophy of their meibomian glands. 
The gland that basically secretes the mybum, which keeps the tears from evaporating too quickly, gives the integrity of the cornea, can ward off some osmosis or excuse me, um, osmolarity changes. So one of the things that I like to do is I walk in and I use the L, which is look. I just look at the patient. I'm looking for some rosacea. I'm looking for some aberrant lashes. I'm looking to see if they have like redness on their lids. You know, I'm looking to see if I see any lesions in and around their face. Okay. The LP is lift and pull. And I'm going to show you what that means in a few seconds, because there are some other characteristics or critters that basically lend themselves towards inducing some of this inflammation and problems that we have. But the last one is my salt and pepper reference. Okay. And this is push. And you need to push it real good. Okay. Push it. If you are not pushing on the meibomian glands, even just a tiny bit, okay, remember 3.0 PSI is not a lot of pressure. And if you have to push to the point where the patient goes, uh, are you trying to push my eye out the back of my head, right? Uh, then you know what? Then you're putting too much pressure on to try to get something out of the meibomian gland. The gland should secrete something that looks like olive oil. It shouldn't look like baby spit up. You, 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 I mean, for those of us that do it enough, we get crazy excited when we can see like this, this like toothpaste swirl coming out, right? Yeah, <clears throat> but that's not good for the patient. It's only good for our amusement, right? And more importantly, if you had a picture, if you were able to show a patient this, then you could say, look, if we don't do something about this, then you're not gonna be able to keep doing the things you wanna do. You know, I don't look in the mirror that often, but you know, 30, 40 years ago, my, my mom kept saying to me, uh, Mark, do, your hair, do you want to do something about it? And I'm like, do what? She goes, just, you know what? I'm, there's, there's lots of things you can do. I, I don't care, mom. I don't care. But now that I'm a little bit older and I go in there, I'm like, damn, boy, you old looking. I look like my dad. I'm like, when did that happen? When did I turn into my dad? And I knew my dad was going bald because he started going bald at 19. So by the time I was born, homie was pretty bald, but he did a comb over thing. And it's just, yeah. I mean, I tried it for a little bit, but it just wasn't working. And I think, what if I would have done something 30 or 40 years ago? Maybe I'd have a little bit more. Um, and then I started thinking, but I have more hair all over my body because I wouldn't want that either. But it's then I, I can't sleep anymore. And then I'm up in the middle of the night. My point being is that I look at my patient's eyes and I think, what can I do today to help them get good quality of tears 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? To me, you know what? One of the things that we can do is we can screen our patients literally by saying when they walk in the room, we talk about screen time, okay? And we can sit there and say, oh, I noticed that you're using an artificial tear already. Oh, and look, it's cute. It's called digital. That's amazing because you're on a computer. I get it. But what about those patients that come in and say something like, you know, what do you think about those, uh, those uh, blue lenses, those, those uh, blue light computer glasses? And honestly, if you just look at the picture here, I will tell my patients what I think of them. I think they're contraception glasses, okay? If you never want to hook up with somebody, then get those glasses, okay? If you stay in your mom's basement and that's where you're going to be gaming for the rest of your days, you, you do you, boo, you do you. But if you're ever interested in ever like having a relationship with a coworker, then take those off. Besides the fact that blue light does nothing, does nothing for computer vision syndrome. Okay. What they do is they reduce the amount of blue light, which is this theoretical kind of concept about, you know, uh, changing our circadian rhythm, how much of that blue light is going to get there, please. You know what? It's going to happen anyway. I mean, if a person has macular degeneration, sure, can maybe consider, but to do this on the internet, if they're coming in and asking you, to me, what they're doing is they're saying, hey, I need help. And this, to me, should be the critical aspect of what we do helping our patients. So I look at screen time, I look at artificial tears, and I also look at patients when I say, hey, have you ever thought about getting those computer glasses? Oh, I have some. Or they ask you, now is your opportunity to sit here and say, let's do something different. Let's make a difference. Because there is no substitute for a natural tear. The natural tears right now basically have growth factors, nerve growth factors, epidermal growth factors. Okay, when we start thinking about, and we'll talk about this probably before the end of the day, is you start talking about autologous serum. For those of you who don't know about autologous serum, literally, it takes all the good stuff that's flowing through our blood 
and takes out the, the oxygenated blood cells. And it basically says, let's take that good juice and put it inside your eye. What I tell patients, I say it's like fertilizer, right? You can plant something in your, your garden, but you need to give it the proteins and the nutrients to grow. An ontology serum does that. Your natural tears does that. So when we start thinking about what we have now at our armamentarium, what we can do differently, we now have a product that some of you might step back and just say, how does this fit into my practice? And this is Tirvaya. Now, I don't subscribe that one treatment should supplant another treatment. I don't think that you sit there and say, well, I'm doing this, so I'm not going to do that. This is a multifactorial disease state. And you heard me talk about Isuvis. I'm going to mention that again, because I think our biggest challenge is this obstruction of the meibomian glands and inflammation of the meibomian glands, obstruction and inflammation. But if you take it back one step further, those patients that are using an artificial tear, the key word here, artificial, do you pick up a can of soda and it says lots of artificial ingredients and you go, yay, that's what I want, Hansen's. We don't have artificial, screw you, Hansen's. I'm going, no, artificial is artificial. I mean, it, there's, just, there's no way around it. it. They last for a few seconds. Honestly, an artificial tear is tantamount. And I, I'll say it again till the day I die. And Ryan, who's back there, who's heard me say a million times, it's like a mint. It's literally like a mento, a Tic Tac, a Cert, okay? Not a, not a Coca-Cola flavor Tic Tac, because those are just fun. They don't do anything to change your breath. Some of you guys who ate here today are thinking, okay, I'm gonna have some coffee, and then there's lunch, and then you're gonna go hook up, and then you're gonna put a mint in, and 10 minutes later, they're gonna go, you need another mint, okay? And you could probably use a mint right now. I will tell patients, I will tell them, you could probably use a mint right now, and they don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm oftentimes talking about their tear foam. I tell them, look, we now have a way to help you make better tears. Tear via, to me, is an opportunity to basically take a patient out of using an artificial tear and say, here's something else to do instead of tears. And for those of you who have never tried it, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't subscribe to the N of one. You know what, I've watched people try it and go, woo, shoo, okay, you will sneeze 100% of the time. And for those of you out there going, oh, so it's a sneeze, so it's not really a true basal tear, it's just a sneeze tear. No, it's not, okay? And for those of you who say, oh, you know what? It's nasty, it tastes nasty. And I feel you, because you're right. If you sniff it, if you snort it, and you huff this stuff, it's gonna go right down your throat and you're going, eh. I mean, it's not for everybody. But what I like to do is I walk to, like to go into a lane and I say, you know what? We now have a drop. Oh no, nay. We now have a spray and I'll ask patients, have you ever used a nasal spray? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I've used nasal sprays before I go. We now have a nasal spray you can use. actually will coat your, your nasal passage and basically stimulate the production of real tears. And I just watch the deadness in my patient's eyes, right? As they're like, ah, and I'm like, so, but more importantly, right now, you could get it into your patient's hand for relatively little to no cost. And when I say that, they go, oh, I want to try this. To me, I look at this as a replacement for an artificial tear, not as a treatment. Now, I know that the people at Oyster Point are going to sit there and say to you, but you know what, Mark, over long term, you know what, we might be able to re-stimulate or reinvigorate this, this intervention of the, the meibomian glands and the goblet cells and the lacrimal gland. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Let's, let's hope and let's see if that happens. But for now, what we're gonna do is use the trigeminal nerve through the nasal cavity, okay? It's the varenicline. And I know if, if Al Cabot's watching me, then he always, he hates the fact that I can never say varenicline, but boom, nailed it, varenicline. Okay, this is a, a nicotinic agonist, which basically works on, it's the same molecule that's in Chantrix. Okay, is, is it, did I say that right, Chantrix for my ex-smokers? Yeah, it's the same thing. So this is a molecule that's been around for a while, but we're just snorting it. And what they find is that 34% of basal tear production is due to inhaling air through the nose. Think about that, right? How that might stimulate things. And that's through the trigeminal nerve. So what you have here is this lacrimal gland, okay? Post-ganglionic intervention through the nasal ciliary nerve, through the trigeminal nerve. And when you put some of the varenicline in the nasal passage, you induce an efferent, excuse me, an a, yeah, a afferent response 
which induces an efferent production of tears. This is a twice a day nasal spray, once in the morning, once at nighttime. And it's stimulating, staying in there, creating, and they've showed studies where you can actually see the meibomian glands elevate, where you see the lipid layer, you can see the oil layer, you can see some of the aqueous production. To me, what's exciting about this, this is different. Now, for those of you who've tried it and go, oh, I don't like it, you know, that's, that's you. But I don't ever try to put my, my, my feelings in the patient. I let them try it. And especially right now, as I shared before, is that, you know what, I know Oyster Point has some really good rebate programs. They're putting your patient's hands. To me, that, that expert insight is saying, look, here's something different. I want to be able to offer to you. I want to get you off using, you know, the artificial tears every two hours, four hours. Now, if a patient says to me, oh yeah, no, ooh, nasal spray, no, no bueno, don't like it. I'd be like, okay, but I wanted you to know about it and offer it to them. Who, who would benefit from this? How many of you patients have seen those tarantulas on the ends of your patient's lids that they call lashes, right? And it's like, and I'm like, oh, you're scaring me with your lashes. And I'm like, how often do you take those out? And like, you know, do you feed it? Does it stay in a cage at nighttime? And I just had this patient the other day, she goes, what are you talking about? And I'm like, don't do it, girl. So, I mean, those patients who wear makeup or do stuff, I'm like, look, hey, would you like to try nasal spray instead? That's where I feel this comes into play. But let's get back to treatments, okay? To me, it's all about making it simple, okay? It's all about, you know, Beth, I hear you call in. That's like one of the only Kiss songs that I can think of off the top of my head. And you know what? We want to get home to Beth. And to me, making it simple in the lane to help our patients is that if you break it down quite simply, if you look at the meibomian glands, every single patient you see, you push on the meibomian gland, you do your LLPP, you push, look there, you see anything less than meibomian gland oil that is secreting beautifully. And if you think of that Priya Gupta study, then you know that every single child, adult, teenager, they probably don't have good meibomian glands today. Is that looking at a patient and saying, look, you know what? Keep using your tears. Those are momentary relief. Here's some tear via to maybe make your own real tears. But what can we do about this obstruction and this inflammation? To me, when I think of the obstruction, it's like peanut butter and jelly, okay? You got the inflammatory portion. And one of the things that I always like to tell them is we have to basically have both. Now, for those of you that don't like jelly on your peanut butter sandwich, then it's not a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, okay? It's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I mean, why would you not put jelly on your peanut butter sandwich? And to be really sincere with everybody here, I don't put jelly on my peanut butter sandwich. And part of the reason why is, is because I drink like 24 ounces of Coca-Cola a day. And so I'm like, damn boy, that's a lot of sugar. So I'm like, do I really need sugar on my peanut butter? Probably not, but I do love it, but I digress. This is the inflammatory portion. And I literally, I am telling you what I tell my patients. I literally will hold my hands up and go obstruction and inflammation, okay? So we need to do one and we need to do the other. And I love showing them a picture of their meibomian glands, or I love telling them what I saw because it makes it real for the patient. And you can translate that back to anything they're doing. They want to wear contacts because they just spent like $1,500 as some specialty contact, or no, they spent like $3,000 to get some specialty imprinted contacts. What are those called? I print contacts. And I, uh-huh. I just did that. I laid in that, that plaster of Paris barely breathing for how long does that go for two minutes <laughs> i mean that was the longest two minutes of my i envision like a straw and then sitting in there for like an hour no okay <laughs> honestly is that to me those patients if they're spending the money to do that how about the people that just bought themselves like a 70 inch television like i can't even see the chiron there was breaking news that just happened and i missed it i'm like don't worry it breaks like every 10 seconds okay breaking news you need to blink more to me, the inflammatory portion right now, you have treatments for this. You have treatments for the long-term chronic patient, for that patient that you go in and you see, you know, inspissated glands or you see lots of polarization. You see patients whose tear quality is reduced significantly. If you notice something, I haven't told you to whip out a Shermer's. I haven't told you to go to tear breakup time. I haven't asked you to do a, a, a dry eye questionnaire. I haven't told you to stain your patients. There are diagnostic ways that you can help to bolster your diagnosis. 
but you shouldn't use those to rule this disease out. And I think part of what we do as, as eye doctors is we say, prove you've got dry eye, boom. And that goes to the word dry, which I hate. Maybe we should say, prove your eyes aren't moist. I got you in the back. To me, if you wanna use these tests to basically prove that they don't, okay, then go ahead and do it. Something like a speed test, five questions. You wanna do some lysamine staining, go for it. Osmolarity testing. You can never have a false high osmolarity. You can have false lows all day long, but if somebody's osmolarity is high, it's gonna be high. But the one characteristic that we know that is pervasive through all of these patients is inflammation. So using something like a CEQA, because it sounds cool, CEQA, right? 0.09% cyclosporin, or go old school, right? Restasis, 0.05%, because it comes in Endura. And because these guys were the first ones to basically demonstrate that we can have a mechanism of delivery that's going to reduce inflammation and help you make more tears. Is this going to completely eradicate and change everything in your patients? No, but this again is kind of humming in the background to help them with their inflammatory portion of it. You also have Zydra, Lefitigras, which is you know, kind of a, the ICAM inhibitor. It's just a, a different molecule than cyclosporin. And I get it too, people, okay? You're gonna write a script and insurance is gonna come back and say, uh, uh, no, not so fast, my friends. You can try this. I think it's better to try any one of these than to not do anything at all. And I will tell you, go out in the exhibit hall or go talk to your reps and get them to espouse on why their molecule or why they think they have the best drop for you. But if you're not even writing for it, then how are you helping patients with the inflammation? For those of you who were here or weren't here, you heard me talk also about the fact that we now have short-term treatments too. I don't just mutually exclusive say, I'm gonna put you on this, but I'm not gonna put you on that. If I know somebody is doing something chronically and, I'm gonna, and I know I keep harping on contact lenses because obviously I don't know enough about contact lenses, which is why I refer them to people that do. Okay? To me, you know what? It's a thin piece of plastic that sits on this vital organ in the human body. And it's like, how can that not be inducing inflammation? It has to be. It has to somehow change the quality of our patient's tears. And so to me, I think a great complement to keeping patients in context is also to work on reducing the inflammation in their eye. And then also talking about the obstruction of the meibomian glands. And to me, for patients that say, look, you know what? I don't feel like my eyes are dry all the time, or I don't feel like I can't wear my contacts as comfortable all the time, but just, you know, maybe towards the end of the month, I have issues or, you know, better yet, when I was watching The Mandalorian because somebody told me it was super cool. And so I watched all episodes one night because it couldn't stop because Baby Yoda kept eating those little eggs. I'm like, what's up? Okay. And for those of you, seriously, people, do you guys not watch? Am I the only person here? Do you like read journals or what? Because that's, is that a thing? Who reads journals? Gosh. Okay. No. For those patients, we now have the ability to basically say, look, you know what? I get you. I feel you. Okay. Here's a drop that you can use. Okay. I, this is the only one indicated for short-term relief of these patients that have um, these flares. And we know, we heard before that patients on oftentimes have about five and a half flare episodes a year. And you also heard me say that, you know what, those are the patients we oftentimes are treating as, as blepharitis because we thought it was a blepharitis. You know, Flarex is also indicated for basically anything and everything in the anterior segment, okay? It's FML, it's a different formulation because it's an acetate suspension versus alcohol. And so it does penetrate a little bit better. So you have options. Okay, one that's indicated for the short term and another one that's basically kind of a, a catch all. Okay, I kind of, I, I prefer the ISUVIS personally because I love the fact that it has just this low incidence of interocular pressure changes. I love the load of Pradenol. I love the, the fact that it breaks down. And we talked about that before. But these are your anti inflammatory drops. And we just are not utilizing our inflammation portion. But if we're going to talk about inducing and making better tears, if we're going to talk about the inflammatory portion, then we also have to talk about what are we going to do about the obstruction. And when we start thinking about, you know, how can we help our patients? How can we be insightful for our patients? Okay, we can do things like warm compresses. 
Now you can ask yourself, okay, this is a home remedy. We're taking them home. We're bringing it on home, right? Well, where do they fit in? To me, these fit in by basically saying, look, it's a spa day. You get 10 minutes away from all your troubles, put a little lavender on there, find some essential oil and drop that bad boy in the microwave for 20, 25 seconds and just let all your troubles go away. I know you're gonna wanna peek at your phone cause you're like, uh oh, you know what? I think I'm blowing up, I went viral, right? I got four views on my last video, right? Here's me and my eight cats. No, nobody's watching that. To me, what these do is they basically say to a patient, look, you've got a long-term chronic problem. The glands are getting obstructed. Here's something you can do at home to help kind of, you know, remedy that a little bit. These to me are not going to solve the problem. So what they're going to do is it's almost kind of like maybe hopefully keep it at bay, kind of like you do with tears. But we have a whole host of opportunities now to work on the obstruction. And when I said at the very beginning about a dry eye clinic or a dry eye specialist who's in your hometown, if you don't have the ability to do this and you're not thinking about buying it for your own practice, then work with the doctor that does. Because I'm telling you, 86% of all dry eye patients in your practice, it's coming from their ribomine glands. And if you're not gonna do something today, then when you look at them in five, 10, 15 years, you're gonna say, damn, I wish I would have done something. And you look at these devices, you know, you have low light and this is kind of scary. I don't know if Wall's gonna talk about this. This is from OcuSoft. This is kind of like a little, you know, it's, it's not completely controlled in the temperature setting. That's the one touch. But we have the other devices that you can have. There's IPL, okay, intense pulse light. I literally had a patient yesterday. Um, I was doing a tear care procedure on her. And I also said to her, I go, look, you would also be a great candidate to do intense pulse light because intense pulse light basically does twofold. One, it makes you look pretty. It's like super cool, right? Gets rid of those blemishes and tightens your skin. She goes, do I have blemishes? And I go, I, 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 I didn't say that. Um, have you noticed though, the lacy little neovascularization around your cheek? She goes, no. And I go, yeah, I didn't either. But I mean, if, if you did, if you did, can I get somebody in here to help me? I mean, IPL basically cauterizes those little blood vessels. It reduces the inflammation that gets to the lids. It's something different than working on the obstruction of the meibomian glands. You've got the Ilux device from Alcon. Okay, you've got the, um, the original, the OG, right, from Tear Science. You have, you know, it's now Johnson & Johnson, the Lippy Flow device. And we also have the tear care system. Now I'll highlight the tear care system for two seconds, basically because it's a little bit different. It's a little unique. The, 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 the site sciences one, the lippy flow, it's all inclusive, it's happening, but it's one of those things where you put in a patient and then they come out and you don't know what happened. And then you got to say, okay, I, I, all right, we'll see ya. With the Ilux, it's kind of in between. You're using an infrared light, you're squeezing on the lids, you're seeing it to a small extent. But what the tear care system does is it basically is this portable system that allows you to basically have patients be comfortable sitting in, a, in an open setting, okay? So I'm gonna give you a case. This is a patient of mine, okay? This was a 43-year-old speech pathologist. Her eyes were terrible. They were red, painful all day. She was allergic to a lot of drops. She, she said nothing helped. She loses lubricants four to five days, four to five times a day, temporarily, no systemic or ocular history. Now, this person happens to be a colleague of my wife's who she said, Mark, I shudder to have you see her because she's high maintenance. And I'm like, okay, thank you. She goes, no, she goes, but I said, look, I go, I don't know if this will help her. I'm confident I think it will. She goes, she's super freaked out. She has super anxiety. A doctor told her she could do the lippy flow system. But she said, there is no way in HE double hockey sticks, that's hell by the way. She said, there's no way that she would do that because the notion she felt claustrophobic, she thought that would give her anxiety. I'm not doing that. I'm not sitting there with my eyes closed, taped, having this thing heating on my eye. And I said, okay. Now her Sandy score, if you don't know what that is, is hella high. It was 78. Okay, the Sandy is kind of like how our patients feel, right? This is what they're looking at. When you look at the tear breakup time, her tear breakup time is low, 3.6 and 5.5. And her OSDI put her at severe dry eye. Okay. And I'm not advocating you do these. I'm just showing you where this person was at. When you look at her meibomian glands, you can definitely see there's some atrophy. 
right, in the meibomian glands, nothing terrible, but look at what the lid looks like. The lid with the mascara and the oils and all the schmutz. To me, when you see bubbles on there, that's saponification, that's meibomian gland dysfunction, okay? Her physical exam, best corrective vision, 2030, 2040. Her tear prism was hella tiny. She had some staining. I look at the meibomian glands. I look, I go through and I take five, 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 nasal, medial, temporal, and I push on them and I grade them in my mind. Three being perfect, which never happens. Zero being nothing's happening. So I look at a meibomian gland score with a possibility of 15 glands, which means it could have like a score of 45. Hers was seven. There was not a whole lot coming out when I was basically pushing on a 3.0 PSI, okay? Here's our signs. To me, these are the signs to basically get you to look at a patient and say, look, obstruction, inflammation. We need to do something. We talk about the inflammation. What are we gonna do about the obstruction? You hit that video for me, guys? Guys, video, hit it, push it. Oh, no, go back. Okay, there's a get on there. No, it worked before. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So I, I don't remember how long this works. I think it goes for like 90 minutes. Do we have time? Can I take into somebody else's time? Okay. So here, when you're, if you're going to do one of these procedures, you need to debride and it is debride. It's D-E-B-R-I-D-E. -E. It is not debris. I don't know who the hell says that. Okay. So I'm debriding this patient. Okay. And literally what you want to do is there's keratin buildup. And I'll talk about that if I get time, because I feel like I'm taking up too much time. You want to get rid of the keratin buildup. And honestly, sometimes patients feel like, oh, that feels good. Do it again. I like it. Okay. I don't know who those patients are. See that? Right? See, I don't look at the back of my head anymore. What is that? What is going on there? Right? I'm like, could we get a better angle, people? And they're like, uh, this is the angle, man. This is the angle. This is the tear care system. And, you know, some might look at it and say, dude, that, that upper lid on the left eye looks a little hanky. Or, and I'd be like, you look hanky. It was because she had, I, I didn't take off as much of the makeup on her because she knew she was going to be filmed. And she was like, please, please don't take off all my makeup. And I'm like, fine. But these, base, these devices basically heat from the outside. But it goes in this little hub. The hub basically can fit in your pocket. It heats up basically about two degrees every like, I think like 30 seconds and gets to about 10 degrees warmer than body temperature. And it holds it there. And then it lets you know when it's done, okay? What's nice about this, this is like an open room. But what I love about this is, is that then I go in and I manually express the glands. And for those of you who have not done it before, this is very gratifying because I actually can watch and see what I'm doing, okay? I can see the glands expressing. I can tell a patient, oh, damn, we're getting some good juicy stuff out of here. And I feel there's a psychological benefit to that. To me, you know what? This is kind of a hybrid system which allows our patients to feel comfortable. But the thing that I like about it the most is this, okay? And if you look at this picture here, you're gonna see something in the upper right-hand corner, okay? Is that this is a patient who said, can I read my book? And I'm like, go girl, you be you, you be you, boo. She's, when they're getting the procedure done, we kind of encourage them to blink, to go through the process. It's, it's a way of kind of reducing the inflammation, okay? We dab them on the drops, but this is your obstruction. You need to have something like this in your practice because you're gonna get things like this. Okay, here's, here's the patient, my bone gland dysfunction, in-office treat, gland, I did the tear care. I told her to use lid scrubs and her breeder mask at home. She was already on restasis, so we already had the inflammatory aspect of it going. Her one month follow-up was this. This was life-changing at the one month. And I am, this is not hyperbole. This is a real patient. And I, if you want, I'll drive you up to her house. She lives here in Paradise Valley, okay? Her best corrective vision gained about a line in each eye. She reduced her corneal staining, but this is where I think the metal meets the road, is I don't often care about what the glands look like. I don't often care about the hyperemia. I sometimes more care about the patients who say they feel better. Look at her OSDI. It went from 60 to 11.4. I have never, and I'm, yeah, I'm cherry picking and showing you a patient that freaking did awesome because you know what? This is just an example of how if you manage that inflammation, and manage that obstruction, how it can make a difference for these patients. Now, the question you may say is, well, how often do I have to do this? You know what? I bring them back every three months and I say, let's look to see if we need to do it again. And you know what? You're doing fine. You feel fine. Let's go another three months. 
Some patients can go a year. Okay. But I don't give them this indication that it's going to be something that it's like, you know, we do it one time and we'll never have to do it again because that's not the way life works. You know, sometimes, you know, you need to go to 11. And if anybody here doesn't know this reference, then that's sad on you too, because why would you buy a bass or an amplifier that goes to 11? It goes, these, this one goes to 11. Look it up, people. Sometimes you need a little more and I get it. And that's when you start saying, okay, we're doing these things. You're still really symptomatic. And that's when you start thinking about things like autologist serum, adding them into the treatment regimen. That's when you start thinking about, you know, a, a, a amniotic membrane, when you have a significant amount of dryness on the cornea. To me, something else that you also have to think about is the fact that we might have patients that aren't feeling anything, but you see significant amount of dry eye signs and, and you basically want to help them. And so you start thinking about how the corneal nerves work, right? And how they are basically protective reflexes for our tear and our blinking. And more importantly, they basically can sometimes start to die. Am I almost done? Okay. How much time? Two? One minute? Am I done? Oh, I'm done. Okay. We just, <laughs> I'm getting yanked. You know what? I think whoever wants to donate their time to me, I will just come back. No. Okay. So I want to just remind everybody is that there is something called you know, neurotrophic keratitis, where patients just don't feel anything anymore. And you could use something like the name that I can't pronounce down there, Coche Bonnet, right, device, or you can kind of go with a cotton tip, right, because patients know it, right, Cotton Eye Joe, is that where that came from? Cotton Eye Joe, neurotrophic keratitis, I don't know, maybe. But that intervention of the cornea, basically, we now have a drop. We now have a medication that can reinvigorate, get those nerves working better again. Right? And this is Acerbate from Dompe. So these are the, the taking it to 11. These are the ones that basically help our patients get there. There's some other jobs down the pipeline. We'll talk about those. It's like obviously front loaded way too much. There's Demodex. We have a new drop coming up for Demodex, another player in this inflammatory causing indications, right? That lift and pull is to look for those. We also have another drop coming out, which is going to help us with the keratin buildup. Okay, so let me break it down real simple. You guys are experts. Go into your practice. Keep it simple. Obstruction, inflammation. Ask yourselves, what can you do today? But then also talk about your patients, what can you do tomorrow? Thank you guys for coming out for your free breakfast. Thank you guys at home for not having your cameras on and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Blumenstein.